You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 1, Basic Background. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're, You're the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? For those of you who've recently joined me on this adventure, this is a re-recording of the original Basic Background episode into audio podcast format. I've been informed that I need to speak a bit slower when I get to the complicated bits, which I'm going to work on, and if possible I'm going to provide illustrations when posting this on YouTube. A comment was made about the title song I've recorded with my son, so I thought I'd share what that's about. The first reason is that I've managed to get my three-year-old son to participate somehow, which is very much in the spirit of Shakespeare's sonnets. And the second is that the song we've mutilated is the Foo Fighters hit, The Pretender, which not only happens to be one of our favorite songs, but which I've recently realized has lyrics that fit the theme of the sonnets eerily appropriately. The universe works in mysterious ways. Either way, please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. This recording summarizes a lot of material. You can find reference material on the Patreon and Reddit pages that I mention at the end, and in the recording description itself. Hamlet and Legacy William Shakespeare and his father John were heavily invested in the concept of legacy, which a lot of people in those days were, but John Shakespeare was a particularly ambitious man, and in the 1560s and 70s had applied for a coat of arms. This was very important, as it would render him a gentleman. He would even be able to carry a sword. One important note about a coat of arms is that it was passed down from father to son. In those days, women could only bear children, not legacy. And in fact, the very idea of a marriage contract was that the man was effectively buying a woman's womb so that he could have a son with his name, who could then inherit whatever wealth or titles he was able to amass during his lifetime. Shakespeare had three children, two daughters and a son, the son being the only child who would carry on his name. Unfortunately, his son Hamnet died in 1596 at the tender age of 11. It is suspected that he died of the Black Plague, though there has been some speculation about other possibilities, but the important fact here is that his death was devastating to Shakespeare, both as a father who loved his son and as signaling the end of his line. A few months after Hamnet's death, the Shakespeare's were finally awarded their coat of arms. A coat of arms without a son to carry them, which would have been very painful indeed. A comment was made on the Wikipedia page for Hamnet. Unlike his contemporary Ben Jonson, who wrote a lengthy piece on the death of his own son, Shakespeare, if he wrote anything in response, did so more subtly. It's interestingly on point, because on Hamnet's death, Shakespeare poured everything that he had into the sonnets, and worked on them for most of the remaining days of his life. He turned them into a tribute and a memorial to his son, to his legacy, and effectively to himself. Unlike Shakespeare's plays, which we only have in writing because members of Shakespeare's company wanted to put together a memorial for the bard, Shakespeare's only published work was the sonnet sequence. The sonnets, along with the attached poem, A Lover's Complaint. A Lover's Complaint by the way, is a poem describing the experience of reading the sonnets, and suggests that Shakespeare anticipated them being somewhat misunderstood. Not only is it the only work he ever published, but it's also the only work of Shakespeare's which has gone largely unnoticed by history. There's no mention of criticism for his sonnets from his time, and it's very hard to find evidence of people even buying it. Roughly 30 years later, in 1640, a man named John Benson republished the sonnets along with other poems in Shakespeare's Collected Poems, in which he not only reordered the sonnets, but also changed the pronouns so that they wouldn't appear to be written to a young man. Until 1780, when Edmund Malone miraculously rescued the original 1609 quarto edition, Benson's publication stood as the definitive version of Shakespeare's sonnets, and so anyone who had read them had been reading a very different set of poems. The influence this has had over current interpretations has never been shaken, and the damage to Shakespeare's memory was done. The sonnets are now traditionally analyzed as missives, or love letters, to a younger male lover and to an unattractive mistress, and it is due to this that we now think of Shakespeare as having been a pederast, sexually attracted to young men, and unfaithful to his wife. This in spite of the fact that the original sonnet sequence is all the evidence we need that neither of these were the case. This unfaithful reading is also the reason why these sonnets have seemed so confoundingly mysterious. When the text is read directly from the pages, consumed as is, 
The intention becomes straightforward, even though the imagery remains stunningly complex. I believe that what initially allowed me to see the sonnets for what they are was my innocence, or ignorance. I arrived at the text without preconceptions, and from sonnet one was haunted by an inexplicable sense of standing over a grave. It is of utmost importance, when we encounter any historical sonnet sequence, to ask what the sonnets are, whose voice they're speaking in, and to whom they are speaking. In this case, they were not written to some aristocrat, or noble, or secret lover. They were written to himself, to the memory of his son, to, the, to his wife, and to us, to any future reader who would rescue these reflections from the darkness of oblivion. When one reads these poems as mourning poems, as poems of love and loss and grief, real love for oneself and one's immediate family, the intention of the sonnets becomes very clear and transforms the mysterious sequence into what is undoubtedly one of the most heartbreakingly beautiful and tragic pieces of writing in the history of English literature. In addition to the biographical sources for the sonnets, there are two textual references that the reader should be familiar with prior to approaching them. It has been well established that in all of his writing, Shakespeare was heavily influenced by Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Shakespeare's sonnets are very precisely framed by Golding's version of the tale of Narcissus and Echo, in which Shakespeare is Narcissus, each sonnet is his reflection, and the reader is Echo. This story is the single thread that connects all of the sonnets in the sequence. It is the story of Narcissus's love for his reflection, and then his reflection's conversation with Echo, the only witness to this love once Narcissus has died. This may seem a little strange at first, but it becomes much clearer going forward how these elements work together. There are too many references to mention here, but please do check out the description for a link to a hurriedly compiled document with a list of direct quotes and references the sonnets contain from Golding's translation. The bottom line is that if you are not familiar with that particular version of the story of Narcissus and Echo and Golding's language, you're going to miss out on a whole lot of what Shakespeare's sonnets are doing. I feel I should mention that it recently dawned on me that the reason the Narcissus and Echo myth was so well suited to Shakespeare's purpose is that each sonnet is a reflection, not just in the sense of mirroring its author, but also in the sense of it being a thoughtful reflection on death, mourning, love, loss, and legacy. The Phoenix and the Turtle The Wikipedia page for Shakespeare's poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle, calls it an allegorical poem about the death of ideal love by William Shakespeare, that is, widely considered to be one of the most obscure works and has led to many conflicting interpretations. The Phoenix and the Turtle follows the same theme as the sonnets and describes both the death of Hamnet and the death of William Shakespeare himself. Shakespeare is the turtle dove and Hamnet is the phoenix and once the phoenix has died it is to be reborn in the form of the sonnet sequence. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking and please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another no. one in your, your place? place? You're, You're the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Never.